I think the, the courage as the method and also courage as the um, phenomena, mm -hmm. then there might be there's two different way to talk about my interest in the courage. I think maybe as a phenomena or maybe sign of time, then perhaps courage manifest as uh, to me, perhaps very important period of early modernist, or maybe even before, but maybe there's something about uh, um, instrumentalized form of visual language, which mm -hmm. actually put out some sort of essential argument against convention yeah or <laughs> image would world be occupied somehow so in that sense uh, distinctively i think what i wanted to bring out is the not about the uh, um, easy collage which everybody does nowadays which borrow some images and comprise some familiar images or even renderings or so much fragmented image we can gather from Google search and everything, but maybe collage I'm interested in is not that kind of collage. How to make familiar object unfamiliar, or how to question about uh, conventional expectations about combination of the things, no? Yeah? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I think it's still a very powerful aspect when maybe actual collage being introduced in like maybe black or picasso start experimenting or moving towards maybe more dada-ish approach which are in the same root as modern movement originated from but somehow there's a split to modernist more moving towards more rational industrialized no kind of term of rationalities comes in, but at the same time, maybe that's why interesting split somehow of some of the collage work from Shubitas or other father, there is also another strand of architectural thought, which remains some sort of barrier spirits of kind of provocation somehow. So, mm -hmm. so I, I thought it would be quite important to really keep those kind of um, context, no, in which to see the um, how history of the city itself somehow more rooted towards phenomena as a collage. No? So therefore, I mean, I don't have to mention about collage city, but somehow, you know, London where we based upon our study and. Uh, Looking at all those study of the collage by David Graham Shane, which actually he's a part of Collage City by Colin Law studies, but somehow the root of it is actually study of city, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, not the design methodology of city itself, but somehow. And I find this very, very encouraging as well. And find a way to question about the aesthetic and certain coded understanding of the um what maybe one hand how city is being interpreted in one way as a progress the another one is described city as cont continuous process of uh, um, destructions and rebuild and change somehow ongoing process itself somehow so i think that is kind of method the way to look at cities as process of change Rather than you know, form it represents somehow. So, so, so the recent, maybe, mm, yeah, mm, go on, yeah. So, so the recent, uh, mm. so, so the collage isn't a representational tool. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to define because. Um, Form, form of design and form of representation, perhaps quite uh, um, difficult to 
distinguish no, in the kind of in art and architecture, no? Mm -hmm. Because some, um, yeah. So, col yeah, collage is representation, but same time, the way we actually recognize space or object, which always have element of collage as a montage or desire to bring some fragments together to make up understanding no? of wholeness somehow, which are kind of... Mm -hmm. So, so to get to collage, mm. we obviously collage is a more advanced version of something which mm. perhaps is the kind of process of recognizing fragments. Mm. So, so within your methodology, mm. how do we get to the point of collaging? I don't understand your question very well. Um, so, what do you mean? so, um, so collage doesn't just, mm. it doesn't just happen out of nowhere. In order to collage, we mm. need those fragments, right? Yes, yeah. Mm. And, and so how, how do we identify the fragments and mm. in, in your methodology of the I unit? See. Uh, I see, for unit, it's probably, um, I still don't know if, to, if it's right words, but uh, we use about sampling, no? Yeah. And it's based on perhaps, um, you know, when you look around, there are lots of really um, good architects always come up with new forms and new structures and new materials, no? So then I think, on the other hand, there might be also necessity to ambitions to reinvent meaning of something already built or something already established. So maybe sampling method is about to just see, maybe there is already enough architectonic and architectural vocabulary already exist as a building in, from the past or current condition. So let's not impose something newness, but try to relook on how existing phenomena, building, detail, um, material language and the structural vocabulary, which are perhaps we have more than enough than how we could recombine or rethink, no? then how to learn to look at things as incomplete as lots of architecture does or urban planning does as well. Because um, you, you see I mean, there are not yes. how many master plan may fail to deliver the actual original promises or long-term plans always kind of diverted into a different way or taking over by another no demand as well. So, mm. so both more be physically and conceptually. So yeah, mm. so and those are another, maybe objects, yeah. Mm. yeah. And then mm. another element of collage, mm. which I found very striking is that it's a kind of collect collective process. Mm. So, yeah. so, so the way UNIT engages with it at an early mm. stage is to, to do it as a group in a sense mm. and to yeah. kind of mm. respond to one another. Mm. So what is the quality of that mm. kind of collective engagement mm. with collage, with architectonic mm. elements? Mm. Yeah. I think I think they maybe simply um, the way you put it is uh, uh, creating form of engagement that uh, bring our conversation going, no, mm -hmm. as a group of twelve ambitious young architects to be, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, to spend yeah. the year at least in London, right? Yeah. Then perhaps we establish some sort of language, visual language and physical language to communicate. So number of detailed observation 
analysis derived from looking at London as a city in various scale. And certainly it's quite an exciting process where we establish some whole palette full of evidence, the way we describe or the way we discuss with, no? So it's in a way kind of, a, um, yeah, it's kind of a study itself. So I certainly find quite exciting experience, I hope, for particularly architecturally trained students to begin to be more interested to engage with city. Then in relationship to architecture we find from city itself, no? To communicate somehow. So it's, I mean, it's yeah, not really yeah. design exercise, but how you use architectural sensitivities and the way of looking at through the scale and maybe means of representation learning from kind of a much bigger architecture as a city itself or urban environment, I suppose. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there is, uh, before we maybe speak more about the importance mm -hmm. of city in your mm -hmm. work. Um, I guess another, another thing that really mm -hmm. led me to uh, Diploma 11 was something that I recognized and I think it's something that perhaps is recognizable from quite far away when you look at the uh, work and that is the kind of value that you put on intuition. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And you know, I don't know how to define it. I don't know what what the intuition is in relationship to. Um, mm. But there is something mm. quite visibly um, done, maybe without an elaborate set mm. of evidence-based rules that you know a lot of the architectural education has been kind of overwhelmed by mm. as a kind of way of designing. Mm. But there is a real um, mm. sensitivity towards, again, intuition. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I think the intuition is quite hard to define, no? I think, yeah. And um, certainly something you cannot teach. <laughs> I mean, no, yeah, right? but something you experience every day, no? Because um, how do you know what's gonna happen in five minutes later? How do you know tomorrow is the same as today? But somehow we actually kind of rely on those um, probabilities of the things as well, but perhaps how this idea of expected near future image is presenting us, then it's not the word, it's not really what the newspaper tells us. Yeah, no? It's not like uh, described with a set of uh, written language, which actually we somehow speculate, no? Yeah? Then I think I think that's something important part of the design, no? Isn't it? Because um, there is a certain sense that uh, you would unconsciously try to make sense of the things, then. I think that's a capacity to expand various different possibility is hold by set of what appear to be um, uh, the world we occupy, then maybe yeah, design is probably try not to describe by rational word, but perhaps we find another 
language to jump the what other possible consequences of the things, then intuition is not about just imagine or fantasy, you know, bring some fantasy scenario. It's about to click, no? <laughs> you know, yeah? Yeah. No? Yeah, then if if designs not to rely upon those um, ability to questions and ability to reimagine, then I think perhaps we're giving away some important role of architects, I think. Anyway, so then in fact, that is most exciting things to talk about and discuss, isn't it? Right. Yeah. So I don't know, mm -hmm. even any element of a um, you know, forensic approach or maybe kind of a detective try to find out what actually happened or maybe archaeologists try to describe or re-describe certain kind of a, um, leading of the past, events take place in the past, which always require some sort of a dimension which you have to really um, describe, no? How you link, how you put together, how you reconfigure. Then I think they are maybe that's why the design process fit in very well, I thought. And that can be, yeah. Mm. But there is something within education more broadly, which is striving for clarity. And, mm. and I'm sure when students come to you, they, they really want the clarity and you almost have to impose this mist of opportunity and slightly not seeing things very clearly in order to get mm. those subtle um yeah mm. things. yeah mm. yeah mm. i don't know um if you imply to my um level of ambiguity we i managed to carry out is that what you're <laughs> implying or kind of a... not really i mean i don't know it's not it's not ambiguous. I never had an issue with that. I had the issue with other things. <laughs> mm, I, I didn't have the issue with ambiguity, but mm. I, you know, myself teaching today, I see, mm. I see what um, it's been not necessarily valued, mm. but what's, what's been imposed on us is to mm. kind of clarify things, um, quantify think, yeah. things. Mm. Mm. Um, explain mm. why is your building facing that way and it's because mm. of the you know mm. whatever sun path analysis mm. Mm. Um, and that is very much mm. not the instinctive yeah. um, approach to mm. education yeah. or mm. design yeah. yeah i don't know the, the different way of addressing the question isn't it or what the question actually stands for because um take your example why building facing to this way, not the other way, no? Then maybe obvious answer might be yes, because of sunlight or another building regulation. But maybe real question is that uh, why it wasn't? Then some people see as a critique, criticism, some people see as encouragement, no? Because, yeah, of course, that maybe makes sense, but the way you're putting this building this way have another important reason behind it, no? And then put into that question more positively, then I think there is a very, very interesting outcome. But maybe nowadays, lots of people, clarity means I have to bring some lots of evidence, argue against this, then probably that can be quite reductive. No conversation. Well, I think so. Mm. So, so when we look at your educational project, mm. which is really, I think, embodied in the Diploma Eleven and mm. the AA, um, how has that evolved through a changing technological, economic, mm. uh, 
social environments. I mean, it, it, there are many levels at which we can look mm. the long history of Diploma 11, which is one of the longest um, diploma mm. units at the AA. Oh, wait, wait a minute. I think, I think Deep 10 is longer than I think. Yes, it's one of the two <laughs> longest. All right, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. When, was it, when was it established, the Colonel 11? Deep 11 is 1996. Okay. Yeah. Mm. That's, I was six years old, so. Right, okay. <laughs> that, oh, God, really? Oh my God. <laughs> that tells us yeah. something. Scary, yeah. Okay. Um, so, so how, when you see the evolution of it, mm. How, how do you feel, maybe in the first instance, not necessarily how the output has changed, mm. uh, but how has the teaching changed uh, in relationship to all these forces? I see. Mm. Yeah. Oh. It is quite uh, hard to explain logically, but I think the Imagine being in the place like AA, no? Then when you look around, there's uh, maybe when I started, perhaps look around, there are lots of uh, different units and different approach. Then the way you wanted to make yourself um, useful in the environment like that, it's to try to deliver difference, no? You, this is what I mean. Like, yeah, so-and-so doing this, uh, some another unit introducing really exciting challenges or certain way, then certainly when you think about Yes, what can I contribute to within this kind of, uh, yeah, no? Different approach somehow. So that might be educational outcome, perhaps, which is missing or which may be overlooked or what has been not giving enough time to study, no? So I think the first part was to importance of uh, object making and uh, the kind of engaging with making and the materialities and uh, slightly more poetic interpretation of familiar objects and materials, right? No? So in a way, how much time and effort you could invest into object making and how that object could actually speak about uh, narrative, history, story, what they stands for. And I thought that might be the um, reflected on to which context we choose and uh, how we really spend time on one-to-one -one scale. No, mm -hmm. somehow, yeah. So then uh, that might be one aspect. Other one is to, um, yeah, to whatever the investigation, how, yeah. Mm, yeah. For example, I think we did the uh, First project in Deep 11 was uh, not in London, it was in Isle of Portland, no stone quarry, which is actually the reason to choose that site was that also that time we were interested in post industrial landscape across England. No? So, but maybe um, particularly more mineral extractions like slate quarry to tin mining to the Portland is a part of that, where how building industries for the making of the city, which how they leave some hole and void and the incomplete, yeah, kind of 
reverse side of the city than you find in elsewhere in the city. Yeah, in the yeah. landscape. Then particularly that time, all those um, kind of communities and industry itself almost diminishing and leaving some emptiness of those piece of land somehow. So I think our approach is try to show the other side of the city, you no know, other story of the city by looking at a particular set of landscape as a series somehow. So, so that's how Portland being always compare, I do mm -hmm. Portland compare with the um, bit of built history in London, no? So I think that is kind of a turning point. A, that how also um, industry moving further from the tail of um, kind of post-industrial landscape was slightly more environmental concern to um, different economical climate, right? No? Yeah? So, mm, yeah. So following that here, then we try to look at the reverse, you know, how also extraction process, demolitions or removal or post-industrial landscape also we will see equivalent of a mining community, perhaps within London itself as a inner city, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, mm. so that is the, so following in 1997, then since then, I think we all stick to site being actually London. London. The site, yeah. Mm. And I mean, this is, I, I guess, the point where we could mm. say that perhaps the educational project mm. from that point is aligned to the development of London as a city. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so looking at um, the changes that London as a city mm -hmm. has undergone from late 90s until mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. is perhaps the more um, visible um, aspect of the unit development. Mm -hmm. So, so maybe without without going year by year, mm. what is how how do you how do you see that change of the city? Mm. Yeah, mm. I I think they uh, try not to be a bit nostalgic, but I think the maybe. Because you know, also even go back to further back in the, my student years at AA, they are actually, uh, for example, my diploma project was looking at Lee Valley. Yeah, no, then looking at the, those um, uh, like it's uh, um. Those acts from the Greenwich um, um, Observatory. If you take the line of coordinate, yeah, further up, straight cut into it, the way the telescope is located, is the kind of how time zone being defined. Then what I was interested in is on those line actually really cutting through dying industrial area where you visit there's abandoned factories, contaminated water, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, those kind of neglected strip of land. Then now you look at it, what's happened in the Olympic and how they developed. Then I think their world was completely different. No, then you go there, you find some car manufacturer which actually stripping the cars and the very inventing different cars and selling it. Yeah, no, kind of, uh, um, I don't know, those kind of really industrial bits to messiness. And uh, for example, 
ガールストンジャンクションズをハックに、there are so many kind of junkyard where you know, repairing washing machines, motorcycle parts to broken radios and、uh, There was the place we go to get some materials to build some furniture or、so、some sculpture、yeah, studios associated with those kind of residues of industries. Then I think they are not only significant production, but city has more space to play, you know, either living conditions and things which is actually.、Um, There are more of generosity yeah, for students or artists, or certain way mixed with some sort of such a right no? yeah?、Mm -hmm. development. And I think that tolerance and contrast is something defining characteristic of London somehow as post industrial and also post colonial. Then also diverse, no? This is, I mean, food to music to everything, but I don't know. I think the, those seem s be taken over by neoliberal values since perhaps the mid 90s become more clearer somehow.、Mm -hmm. And maybe that's where I find quite Alarming because when you think about、uh, when you study about architecture in London, but city doesn't give you enough room or space for young graduates to practice or start up, so something more exciting. Perhaps、um, those opportunities are so small, or even、yeah. people come to this city to study. Then, Perhaps cities become so expensive and also so homogenized or gentrified in a certain way. Then I think there might be a lot of damage into cultural values and things like that somehow. So I think partly maybe leading of those leftover space, inner edge, maybe if it's not about the nostalgic approach. But try to demand how, what kind of space and opportunity where individual visions or individual approach can still be kind of giving some importance to it. So I think that might be reflecting something happened today. But I think probably interestingly, when we as a unit, When we start in sampling and collage, it actually coincides with the Lehman shock period. Yeah, where、yeah, lots of、uh, imagine suddenly, oh, perhaps maybe the city is not really growing as they planned. Some unfinished bits of a city plan, yeah, or kind of unfinished condition you see in Battersea. Or Elephant and Castle at that time, which is actually highlighting interesting friction between cultural value and economic value or social kind of conditions in relationship to you know, kind, of, kind of urban renewal somehow. So I think it's quite a shocking condition, but at the same time, find kind of interesting room. You know, what, what if the city is perhaps maybe London's combination of something rapidly growing and also things are left behind or things are kind of unresolved, then maybe creating more opportunity to kind of finding effective way to turning those issues into creative opportunity. So, are you ever worried? Are you ever worried that the、mm. work of the unit,、mm. in its kind of speculative、mm. sense, because the projects are obviously speculative,、mm. do in some way、mm. go in the same direction with that gentrification process? 
And how do you mm. how do you battle with that mm. um, tendency? What what do you mean by that? Um, well, you know, if mm. I mean that mm. um, things that students propose mm. and conversations that are being had mm. are often to do with you know improving opportunities for different inhabitants of the city or mm. changing the city in a way that it facilitates mm. functions that mm. have been marginalized. Mm. Uh, but once we propose mm. architecture that mm. is dealing with those issues mm. in this neoliberal condition, Mm. we might be actually working for the benefit of the development. Oh, yes. Yeah, I think that that's, uh, that's exactly the topics, I think. It is in a way, it's so much easier to say, well, there's, uh, you know, empty space, or why can't we use it for this or that, right? Then already developer doing that too, isn't it? <laughs> so, yeah, no? some meanwhile use, you know, artists study being introduced for certain in between period. Then in fact, for some developer might be an opportunity to, you know, that's happened in many places, right? Yeah, no? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think A is that if the, if the outcome of looking at those reality and if students, individual students, genuinely believing that is a good thing, then I don't think I can argue, right? Yeah? Outcome, no? As long as been really making kind of a fair judgment about it, because that kind of a sense of value is not something I can teach, no? As a, yeah? It's, it's, I mean, no? Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, one thing is good for one and maybe might not be answering to others as well, I think. But maybe I would rather put into a bit more different type of question about the value judgment. So interesting topics maybe comes out today. It's probably exactly on that, on sense of value, whose value it is, is a short, term value to long term, no? Or immediate one to this, which including maybe environmental impact or even, this I mean, no? But so sometimes we see, um, yes, maybe archeological interest on this particular site, which are probably interesting to argue against existing value of certain way, then what sort of friction, what sort of conflict with resolving new unresolved somehow. So in that mm -hmm. sense, maybe outcome of it, no? Not in terms of saying archaeology is more important than commercial development. Probably they are all equally interesting if you see it in a certain way, as long as we could see what sort of um, um, opportunity to open up. I, I don't know, I, it's a bit difficult to explain, but uh, yeah, so, yeah. Mm. but this in a way, I think to, to look at a few topic which some of the projects touched upon, either historic underlying histories, slowness of archeological process combined with modern technology nowadays, then how you know, which buried under this ground. Then every time a new development happen, there's opportunity to start to open up. And what sort of kind of worm they open up when they build some, you know, when they start digging some for the foundation and so forth. And what if there is kind of a clash between these two values, and what sort right. of condition may provide as a new, yeah, no? kind of re-grounding the city itself and whose ground it is or this I mean no then or some project looking at the 
um, embedded contaminations, which are you know, showing that, that uh, perhaps um, industry is died, but it's not really dead yet because those remain no, of uh, either harmful for human bodies or environment. They are actually part of uh, objects or materials. Um, rather than removed and the piling somewhere else to deal with, is it possible that city probably also maintain kind of un, untouched ground or safeguarding some places mm -hmm. for long term effect? It's also quite interesting how we can propose some unusable places in relation to the rest of the condition. And I think, I think there is open up some lots of, you know, might have been sounds a bit optimistic, but somewhere at least kind of providing some question, no? Listen, I mean, can yeah. we design real empty space in this city? Would it be more effective than building new or possibly even step further? Is it possible to improve the city by removing some part of the architecture? It's already occupied or delaying some process and what would be the effect, no? Yeah. Yeah, and um, I think it's it's interesting to get a sense of the some of the some of the thinking that is going in the heads of the students. Mm. And it's and it's maybe a good point to really zoom out. Mm. You know, we're constantly like zooming in and out. Uh, but to really zoom out, and if we if we kind of try to conclude this part of the conversation where mm. we talk about education, mm. is to really ask a very kind of a blunt question as to what what is the function of the architectural education? Oh, mm. I see. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, so let's let's say why why people pay for the education to be educated as an architect, and why somebody like me get paid by <laughs> talking about architecture, right? No, then that's in that case, educational industry is very strange things because um, you know we don't produce anything tangible. Right? Yeah? No? Ideas and the discussions and uh, so, yeah, as uh, ambiguous as definition of the, what architect is and a certain extent, maybe what architecture maybe is defined and school of architecture is about, think about architecture and what architecture could be. That therefore, you know, question about architect itself to continue to redefine. So I think that's probably the way maybe at least if we situate school of architecture in contemporary context, then perhaps that's how we defined. Is what I mean, no? Then I think architecture education in certain way I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's probably, sometimes I feel that uh, there are mixture, some still, some people have a bit of a classical ideas about architects. I want to be architects like this. Therefore, I go to school to learn. Then you succeed. No, then there's nothing wrong with that. But maybe other type of students, which nowadays become less, is want to study architecture because maybe that's the way you could effectively influence the world or influence the 
real space. This I mean the knowledge and the language and means to change things. So architecture is not really purpose, but it's kind of purpose is everywhere. But those people, perhaps nowadays might not be so interested in architecture. Maybe they, they want to study economy or they want to do kind of politics or um, activist or, or there's many different means to achieve different things, right? So I think in that sense, maybe architectural education might be a little bit in crisis, which if it's not really kind of valuing or maybe um, putting those um, questions of why drive some young and ambitious creative people wanting to study architecture today. And I think that might be quite an important question to ask ourselves somehow because there's so many criteria and uh, things keep students of architecture very busy, right? <laughs> I mean, no? Yeah? yeah? No? Like you have to learn the skill, you have to write, you have to design, you have to do this, and it's quite uh, lots of things. Then perhaps um, I don't know, um, might be nicer to have a little bit more, relax a little bit and have a little bit more room to... Maybe, maybe the, way, the good way to go about it is to mm. say that the function of architectural education mm. is not to produce architects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I think, the, I think relax what I meant is that, yes, maybe, Architecture education is to learn how to enjoy looking at the space and enjoy looking at cities to describe. And uh, I don't know, that's another ability of uh, educated architects does, isn't it? Go to different cities and talk about it. And uh, this might sound a bit elitist or snobbish, but uh, there are some sort of fascination about space where maybe other people are not trained to do or maybe introduced to, mm. but maybe to communicate those way of enjoy looking at space or buildings or history through the built fabric is probably also important part of architectural educations to, I don't know, yeah. And it's within that sounds that... like a bit, bit like a pure academics talking about things. So, probably maybe I should take this back a lot. Anyway. No, but I think it, it relates it relates to um, mm -hmm. what the unit what diploma 11 um, I think it, it relates to an education that one gets with mm -hmm. you and that is this kind of hyper sensitivity mm -hmm. towards mm -hmm. the uh, details of the city mm -hmm. and perhaps the most kind of obvious uh, way to talk about it is the notion that you always introduce mm. to students very early on, and that is the Thomasons. Mm. Mm. So, so why is the Thomasons the way to see the city or the way to be aware? Mm. I think it's, uh, yes. Um... I don't know. Um, I think it's quite useful to kind of find a way to appreciate some sense of uh, incompleteness and certain um, celebrating status of architecture, which not really designed by its original intention, no? Then there's something quite nice about those um, way of observing and the way of giving some bit more spotlight into something mundane or something familiar, but maybe give some more value to these things probably. So as a reminder, but at the same time, maybe Thomason, as you know that it's uh, actually Genpei Akasegawa started as a 
kind of anti-metabolist city of Tokyo no, in the 70s, somehow, where whole city has been kind of rapidly developed with political propaganda. And then the sick day, him and the group of art, art, artists at that time pay attention to something left behind those large phenomena. Then try to celebrate, to, 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 to find language to give some essential beauty on those things which actually remained or, yeah, no, kind of useless, but at the same time maintained for some different reason. And I think that's quite an um, interesting way. But I think Thomason rooted back to even further back in, uh, there's some kind of architect called Wajiro Kon, which are actually very influential. It's in terms of observation. So he started this street observation as a kind of a work of his own right, right after um, Tokyo's um, uh, first major earthquake, where whole city has been shaken and shaken and burnt somehow. So then when all those buildings is gone and uh, the way of his practicing architecture is uh, with sketching out and detailing and uh, observing that he made a whole sort of series of really beautiful drawings of uh, how people wear certain clothes, how they're behaving, how they live, and some set of built buildings to all those bits and pieces somehow. And I think he made a huge impact, no, somehow. So at the end of the day, when the architecture has been diminished and the city is there, but he, his architecture is about observation of status somehow. So I think there's something around this kind of a position themselves as a Islamic architecture, architects as a, also represent city through what they produce, either drawings or objects or building, which perhaps um, something quite uh, meaningful, I suppose. No? Yeah. Mm. So, mm. Because there is an aspect of, mm. when we talk about Thomasons, and again, to, to clarify to probably mm. people that listen, that might not Mm. understand what we're talking about are precisely kind of leftover components that mm. have almost achieved the quality of a contemporary art piece mm. so a stair that leads nowhere mm. a door that opens onto mm -hmm. nothing mm. and kind of things like that mm. but so so I, I understand i understand seeing a poetry in it. Mm -hmm. I also understand seeing a subversion of mm -hmm. architectural components mm -hmm. that might be a kind of a kind of exercise for architects to kind of see things differently and then mm -hmm. somehow maybe push the boundaries of uh, these mm -hmm. kind of architectural components in their own work. Mm -hmm. But but is Thomason also statement or a reflection on the architectural profession. So we're now admiring these components that are mm. not directly designed. Mm. Mm. Yeah. My, I think certain extent, if there's some people have a capacity to um, appreciate or enjoy or yeah, no? then can be translated into maybe architecture lyric or something, then depend on the, what type of architectural practice, but uh, yeah, if there's somewhere, I don't know, um, yeah. If there is something, for example, when if you're designing buildings somewhere, but maybe, 
there's a bit of an element which you leave some part which asking people to learn to ignore its existence, then that might be a good thing rather than rationalize and uh, clear it, erase them totally. No, you, you see what I mean? So yeah, from either architectural point of view or maybe urban planning in some way in which if you have a hundred percent of site, uh, probably you decide that maybe 10%, I'm not gonna touch it, I'm gonna leave it for some other things taking place because we have unknown bits, no, from past or from the future type of thing. And that's why actually value of the fragment remains somehow. So perhaps maybe those um, kind of uh, considerate decisions which may be influenced mm. by sometimes very simple you no know, value judgment of how do you value value this? No, do, 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 do you see what I mean? No. Yeah. Mm. Often, but, often economic forces that yes. decide mm. yeah. what stays. And... Mm. But further extend though, I think probably if you compare to a bit like Thomason's as a meta art compared to like Dishon's ready made or sense of displacement. Perhaps um, maybe in look at the history of architecture, some architectures are really celebrated then all of a sudden kind of become meaningless for some reason because mm. sense of value change or some statue used to have a very heroic meaning but all of a sudden become evil meanings, right? No, yeah, this happened. Which means the figure and ground relationship. So for example, if you design the ground as opposed to architecture as a figure, then probably there's quite lots of interesting approach can be made, no? Another, another kind of important aspect of your educational project, we've obviously said that the diploma unit is the central one, but it's not, it's not the only one. Mm. So, so, so you engage, you engage in a lot of workshops in a lot of you know visits to foreign cities mm. and different cities and mm. Mm. Uh, London is a starting point but it's not the the place where you can source all the knowledge from so so you often go elsewhere and you learn from other places and you and you come back and mm. you kind of examine how uh, those mm. lessons could be applied to to London in a, as a city so, mm. so can we can we just briefly talk about that? We could reflect on that notion of other cities mm. and the other mm. being a place to mm. learn from. Can you can you reflect on that value of other other cities? Yes. Um, yeah. I think, I think when you look at the history of the city, learn from architecture, no? Yeah? Then maybe we could read some sort of a pattern. Then there are some similarities. But there is a difference, right? No type of material, so they have the urban court, political, and this, whatever. But I think the perhaps um, way of, as you see it, maybe the relationship with Thomason, so Gen Genpei Akasegawa, or metabolist, my always interest might be more comparative study with Tokyo and London, the city, perhaps. Uh, physical densities and grain of the city, they might be quite similar. Mm -hmm. But maybe London's not yet very same as European cities and other. No, but I think there is a distinctive difference, but at the same time, there's very strange um, assortment, mismatch. And maybe some capacity to celebrate those mismatch conditions appeared in Tokyo, either maybe not so much in architectural 
argument, but maybe art or some, yeah, no? Certain extent, maybe poetry and so forth is actually quite uh, encouraging example. Uh, so as uh, London as well. So in a sense, I think the, not in terms of they are similar, but something to learn from both sides to it, which actually kind of, uh, yeah. Mm. You see what I mean? But on the other hand, if you sometimes really look at the historical component, which architectural language, because London is also very kind of post-colonial and uh, kind of mixture of different kind of uh, architectural style as, uh, no? So when we look at the Detroit as a shrinking city, then we always find some small portion of London's related to those patterns. When we look at the, um, I don't know, um, yeah, um, yeah, Belgrade, then we find some similar timing that you, makes you wonder, yes, why this um, architectural language and uh, type of scale developments actually came from, then coming from sort of similar route, but maybe see that in different place, then results will be very, very different outcome, no? One become more political, the other one may be presented as a social kind of a dystopian condition in certain different corner of London itself. So I think when we start reading those things about the uh, yeah, cross reading between cities, then perhaps um, it's, I don't know. Yeah. Do, 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 do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are different levels, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Some of them are very uh, sort of master plan uh, level mm. of the development of a city, mm. but some are very a much more one-to-one -one scale. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's within that um, scale mm. discrepancy mm. that, or or just the question of scales, mm -hmm. yeah. um, where we can see certain mm -hmm. connections. So what is that kind of strong connection to Tokyo? Um, is, it, is it to do with scale? Mm. Or on which scale is that mm. connection established, do you think? Mm. I don't know. Um, Hmm. 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 I, I think the, 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 I think one could summarize it's about the messiness of the city, which um, messy in terms of, uh, for example, Tokyo never had a kind of large scale urban planning succeeded. Yeah, there's a lot, instead there's a lot of rule and regulation you have to follow, height limitations to no uh, usage of the building, but it's also constantly change, no? because city understand that it's actually economy, economical growth and allowance of the volume, or maybe also land ownership and the inherited tax, they are all integral part of the metabolism of city somehow. Mm -hmm. So it is quite interesting how different interpretation came out from those guidelines how to get away or what is the way, escaping and this, then, then make something quite uh, messy. You know, when you look at it, it's kind of, you never understand why it has to be like this. Why suddenly cemetery right next to this another type of program or yeah, no? Then certain way it's quite interesting. Yeah, as, <laughs> yeah. as long as you follow the rules, you can do whatever you like. That kind of, uh, 
ground, <laughs> maybe yes. not intended, but just come out and actually quite an interesting model of the city itself, right? No? Some leading yeah. architects would also hesitantly say, well, sorry, Tokyo is very messy and this or that, but in fact, it's very, very nice in a way. Yeah. Then I think London's have that kind of, uh, um, you know, failures and successions of uh, inherent, yeah, no, kind of uh, binary development that the city is inherited somehow. So that is quite uh, interesting ones too. Yeah. So anyway, did you did you recognize Tokyo in London somehow? Mm. And therefore, that became your. I mean, I'm mm. now kind of putting it well, in well, a more. Some, of some a... Portion, yeah, some portion of it, but I wouldn't necessarily, but some part where mm. maybe some Tokyo waterfront, which obviously inspired by Dockland development. So they tried to do the same, then mm. failed, or maybe succeeded in one way. And uh, uh, but in a way, Dockland is a very particular example of the city in London itself too, isn't it? No. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so bits and pieces, I suppose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the same time, maybe same terminology, but uh, maybe how how some of the successful public space in Tokyo associate with uh, um, kind of accidental conditions which provided by infrastructure development which is actually quite interesting one to look at for well, some type of space you see it but they come back to London saying well yeah if this space in Tokyo it would be quite really really good public space but why people not encouraged to think like that way. It's quite interesting mm. to in the proximity to infrastructure. So certain portion of the land, which one side represent of opportunity, the other side see as a kind of a, um, yeah, discouraging, mm. undesirable place. Somehow. So yeah, in that sense, maybe, yeah. Mm. And there is also, so, so that's a connection to, to a kind of this kind of intense urbanity of Japan. I guess another, another place where you learn mm. from is um, mm. rural Japan mm. Um, mm. and Koshirakura. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, the village, a small village where you started a kind of building construction workshop. Mm. which you've been running for how many years? 25. Wow. Yes, yes. That is a long time too. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and presumably the, the, the village has shrunk, right? Yes, yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. So when you came, was mm. it many inhabitants? Yeah, when I went there, it was probably over 200, although it's really shrinking, yeah, 25 years ago, yeah. Mm. But today, 500. Today it's less than 100, maybe 80 something, yeah. Mm. And how, how have you transformed it? Yeah, but I think, I think moment. maybe, yes, I think perhaps some. Um, Slightly misleading its uh, intention was to build there. I think, I think the, maybe the real motivation behind is to uh, build something small and tangible and a little bit of uh, um, utility as ambition, but it's, uh, it's a form of communication somehow. So as yeah, an event where you know the young non-Japanese students of architecture regularly come and do things and demand certain bizarre things then for locals to engage with this activity in certain way 
then that's certainly the form of communication, no? Mm. From both sides, I think. Then we need architecture to do it, including construction process and method and gathering materials and argue and discuss. And uh, that is the more, most important part. So in a way, perhaps, um, of course, there's a the physicality of it, but quite a lot of building merged and uh, rebuilt or it's not working and be replaced somehow. But in a way, this are kind of form of communications going as well, I think. Because, um, um, yeah. Then at the same time, perhaps some um, long time ago, we already kind of give up the ideas of um, make, village more populated you see what i mean no because um it's very hard life and also if you imagine there's a young people growing up there then there are no much opportunity you see what i mean for education so work and professions wise then perhaps um we can't expect them to stay yeah yeah no then unless there's much another opportunity being given because then some little small people amount of people moving in because maybe they can do certain new type of agricultural work mm -hmm. or some retired people or maybe some people who can work with more online no kind of programmers and things, but they are really minorities and uh, because of the climate and heavy snow and the weather and uh, even internet is not really fast compared mm -hmm. to other places. So I think probably it's a bit hard to imagine, but then at the same time, when you look at so many villages like that exist in Japan, not only Koshirakura, so yeah. Yeah, so I think to, at least for the past 15 years, we just wanted to just keep it going until um, things are beautifully shrunk into maybe at the end, maybe one or two houses left or something. Mm. But uh, why? On one hand, maybe why it's so such bad things. If the people are happy, they are still doing things what they do. It's not really so bad, no? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know I mean? no? Then some locals think, well, yes, maybe we don't go out to outside, but world comes to them once a year. Well, yeah, no, yeah? no people come and do things and they enjoy somehow. So that might be if they're making small buildings and continue to engage and with us uh, enough from um, sense of purpose, so what, but they will be good things. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So sometimes it's very, sometimes mm. it's, well, I suppose it's easier to see the learning mm. connect, the connections of the learning from city to mm. city mm. and less so with environments such as Koshirakura. Mm. I think the Koshirakura is as probably what uh, also participating students to learn, no? Mm. What sort of uh, direct memory they create by engaging with this and uh, meeting with some very specific type of uh, um, social uh, sustainable community, then I think that brings some very important um, impact in the way they carry somehow. Yeah. So I think that will be what it's like to really, you know, looking at the site and uh, finding the materials and then build from scratch. Mm. 
you know, putting stones and putting columns and finding this and uh, all those bits. It's actually quite. Uh, there is this whole process of right? yeah. there, mm. there is a whole process of repair yeah. of the previous As uh, well. objects yeah. that mm. you've yeah. done. Mm. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. So I think the Kushirakura have two, maybe my personal agenda might be because that's the year when we finish with uh, um, post-industrial landscape series in London, you know, in England, I mentioned before. Then I think my actual interest was that although Japan doesn't have an industrial revolution equivalent, yeah, but um, there is a post-agricultural phenomena where agricultural industry diminished and replaced by all those cheaper rice and uh, you know, timber from Canada, food from the United States, and all those um, farming communities which are actually decline, decline of population started from perhaps maybe late 70s or 80s already. So Koshirakura is one of those places, no? mm -hmm. somehow then looking at how the landscape change, vegetation transform, and uh, uh, lifestyle transform over a period of time, which is actually quite uh, dramatic somehow as well. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so we are looking at or engage or reading this comparison to Tokyo and Kushirakura is maybe one of these um, issue or topic which have running the workshop to actually document those changes through kind of the life of putting the lens of the yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. kind of educational yeah. activity yeah. and mm. yeah, mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. i mean i think we touched on some really interesting points mm. and you know i have i have a long list of things but in mm. a sense i think we mm. uh, there was one there was one thing, if you don't mind me, just to conclude. Mm. Mm. Um, and that is that when we went to Belgrade, for me, it's, it's always such a pleasure to see the, your development of thought, mm. right? Because I can, I can very um, easily look at things that are new mm. or different and mm. um, because, because there is a real kind of strong culture that somehow mm. Mm. Uh, is always present. So that's why these things that emerge, the new references mm. are always very refreshing for me. And one of these references was when we were in Belgrade, you presented, mm. presented some of the uh, work to the students there and uh, you included uh, Lewis Carroll's diagrams. And that was uh, the first mm. time, that was the first time mm. um, I saw you talking about them. And I was just, um, I, mm. I really thought that was a very nice way of, mm communicating things. Did this come about fairly recently? Or is this uh, no, something you've been the, thinking about for Louis, a long time? Louis, yeah, uh, no, I think the Louis Carroll has been my interest and I always fascinated by those diagrams somehow. It's uh, symbolic logic and the game of logic actually. Yeah. But I think, I don't know. Um, I don't know why that's very, very important, but somehow, um, I think because Carol is the mathematician, no? Yeah. So I quite like this um, approach to just treating words and the sentence as the same as object. Then it's actually how, how you could actually remove its meanings and switch to something else or how to make sentence meaningless by just shifting way of composing somehow. So I thought that's kind of, a, um, if it's more instrumentally used then can be quite exciting somehow. And partly, maybe this is just after thought, but very great. Something I was quite amazed about is that how, how this political landscape is actually embedded in the way how people understand the city. Because it's all about connotations, all about incident, all about the narratives. Then it's actually so heavy, no? Is that what I mean? Then 
those are not tangible. Those are maybe you just reading history through fragmentary list bits of mark pen left. But it's actually, I don't know. Um, I have a very mixed sense and um, afterwards, after thought. So yeah, there might be a two different cities. One is actually narrated, described, then which most people occupy. Then physicality is the other, no? Then I like, or maybe I'm fascinated by this separation somehow. Then is any way to re-narrate the city or the questions either? It's not about to be visioning, you know, kind of bloody past as forgotten. But maybe there's multi layers and some way that if the words can actually question about, uh, yeah, is <laughs> it no? Yeah? yeah. So if there's maybe a way to set the more clear diagrammatic understanding to scrutinize, but at the same time question, that might be quite an exciting way to 